Uh, what a great day for us to be able to worship together and uh, to be able to gather in this way. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of John. We're continuing in our uh, study through the Gospel of John. We've been in it now over a year, uh, and we are uh, certainly taking our time, being very careful, and we'll see why that is so important today as we look to this passage. John chapter 12 is where you're going to find uh, we are today. John 12, starting in verse 37, we're going to go down to uh, the end of the chapter there. And that's where we're going to be finding ourselves in our reading this morning. But after you found your spot in John 12, verse 37, I want you to flip back just a few pages in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, because I want to point out to you what is for us every time we gather uh, to read God's Word together, a really important reminder. John, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, verse 24. I'm just going to read the first part of that verse. Mark uh, 4, verse 24. And so hopefully you found your spot there. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning as uh, we read God's Word together. This is going to be a brief but an important reminder from the lips of Jesus through His Word to us. Mark 4, 24. This is what He writes. Consider carefully what you hear. Consider carefully what you hear. Let me pray for us. Father God, we stand before you now thanking you for your word because we know by it we have eternal life where we need to hear your truth desperately. But we confess to you that we have come to open your word often and we've not really heard it. We've not paid careful attention to the instruction you've given, to the promises and the warnings, the commands. Lord, I pray that our standing here today and even the silence which surrounds us, will give greater attention to your word. So that, Lord, it would resound throughout eternity, your truth in our hearts today. Not so that it could just somehow be kept inside us, God, but so that it be lived out in faith. Lord, your word draws us near to find your mercy. Your word exposes our sin for which we are desperately in need of your mercy. And so now again, let us do so. Jesus, we have sung of you today. We have gathered in your name. So much that we do in our gatherings focuses upon you, and for this we are thankful. But God, we do so not out of habit, because you are worthy and deserving of this. So let us consider carefully again you, Christ, and the way you revealed yourself through your word. Lord, you know that in myself I have nothing good to bring, but Jesus, just as you blessed just a small amount of food and multiplied it to thousands, will you bless this gathering here today so that it, it multiplies your truth, so that, God, your people are brought near and that our lives are changed and your gospel is proclaimed and new life is given. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for your attention along with me this morning. Uh, you know uh, that the intricacies of the human body are really beyond description, aren't they? When we begin to consider, we take it for granted. These bodies that God has given us until... We become sick or uh, ailed in some way, and we begin to really then appreciate uh, the health that perhaps we once enjoyed or hope to enjoy again. It's God's creativity, His glory upon us, and it's any number of ways that we can experience uh, this in the bodies He's given. But I want to focus on one because it's the one that Jesus focuses on in the words we just read from Mark chapter 4, and that's the gift and the ability of hearing. It really is 
if you study it biologically, amazing what God has given in this gift. You see, there are, within your ears today, though you can't see them, uh, numberless, minute parts, uh, really uh, invisible to the naked eye, that are all at play for you to be able to hear and to give us a capacity to make sense of, of the, the sounds of airwaves clanging together as uh, they come to us. Did you know the smallest bones in the human body are all located inside your ear? The anvil, the hammer, and the stirrup, located in the middle air, and they're, they're, they're fitted together perfectly because they transition that airwave of sound into something that is sensible to us, legible to us. Did you know the length and the diameter of your ear, your outer ear, the, where the sound enters into? Did you know that it is perfectly fitted for you to hear sounds, especially the sound of human voice? Isn't that amazing? That God shaped our ears to be able to hear sounds of other human voices uh, perfectly fitted in just this way. God has designed us to hear words. Now, this is not lost on most of us we speak often and we hear often uh, right now you're doing that you you probably hear thousands of words every day why if you if you live with a female in your house you probably hear more than that all right you hear lots of words every single day countless we could say you would think because of this we really value the gift of hearing but but what we know is that experientially and even scientifically, oftentimes we take it for granted. Oftentimes we uh, perhaps are, are recognizing sounds, but we're not really hearing. Isn't that what Jesus was saying here? I want you to carefully consider what you've heard. You hear sounds, but you don't really hear. Let me give you an example for which I think you can probably appreciate. It's been several, some time ago now, uh, that uh, our family had come in from a long night of activity as your family is probably busy just throughout the week going from place to place and place. And so we were in the same vein. It was late, and we were, I was anyway, very hungry. And, uh, and we came in, and, and Janae and I began a discussion about something, and, and we even spoke of it this week. I have no idea what we were discussing. I really don't. I, I wish I had known then. I would have stayed out of trouble. But we didn't know what we were discussing at the time. Uh, we can't remember now. We did then. And... You know how discussions go when you're hungry and you're tired. They can tend to take a sharp turn in the wrong direction. And sure enough, it, it, it started to turn in that way. Our tone became a little bit harsher. Our words became a little bit sharper toward one another. Now, I know you probably have the perfect marriage and you never fight, okay? Uh, don't look at my marriage for that because we, we began to just become a little more and more agitated with one another. And the fact is, I really wasn't listening. I mean, you just really won't be at the bottom of it. I knew what I wanted to say, but I really wasn't hearing what she was saying. And so as this progressed and continued, the reality is all I was really hearing was my stomach, all right? And I was hungry. And I don't care how mad we are, I got to eat, all right? And so uh, as this continued on, now we had, we had prepared that night we were going to have a um, a part of what we were having anyway was salad. I remember that salad was involved in it. I'll tell you why I remember that. Because as we're eating, we're standing there together, and, uh, and, and I just kind of tersely said, uh, I mean, are we going to eat or what? And, uh, and, and, and she just kind of tersely said, well, if you want to eat, why don't you go ahead and fix it? You know, I, I didn't expect that. And, and listen, here's what I really didn't expect. Now, I'm going to share something with you. That is, I, I probably could have called the police, but I didn't, all right? I held back. The next thing I know, salad leaves are flying through the air in the direction of my face, all right? Now, if I had not been, if it weren't for my cat-like reflexes, you probably would see the damage all over my body as these heavy, thick leaves are flying at me. Janae's never thrown anything at me before in her life. I don't know what overcame her that night. But something I said got her, and I caught it. I caught it. It was in a bag. I caught it, you know, the bag. I mean, it probably weighed all, what, I don't know, eight ounces. And I caught it, 
And, uh, and I, I mean, it, that really offended. I can't, you just threw something at me. I can't believe you just threw something at me. You know, then it became about something else, you know, uh, another thing. And it was a few hours before finally we could laugh about it, and we, we, we could uh, step back and get some perspective uh, actually on the thing before any more bodily harm came. Uh, uh, you know, it was after this that, that we really had to come to terms with realizing that what started it, and it was primarily me, is I wasn't hearing. I was speaking, but I wasn't hearing. I wasn't listening. You know, um, it's why James gives us this warning, this instruction in his first chapter. He says, be quick to listen, slow to speak. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Right? And so it was this admonition that we need to, we need to follow. It, it, it'll help us in our relationships and and perhaps it'll, it'll keep the vegetables from flying in the kitchen, right, at unwanted times, whatever the case may be. Listen, it's this ability of hearing to which Jesus is speaking here. Because infinitely more important than hearing what each other says, and that's important, is hearing what God says. It's his word. Because you see, our words, according to Samuel, will fall to the ground. But the words of God are forever. Within his word is eternal life. To whom else could we go? And so if we're going to gather together in a setting like this, and we're going to say, I, I listen to the preacher, all right? it's not so much the preacher, but the preaching of the word of God, to which we must hear today and be very careful to do so. Because God describes for us in John chapter 1 that he has revealed himself, through his son Jesus. And what is Jesus called in John chapter 1? He's called the Word. So he's revealed himself. He's spoken to us. He's, we have the written Word of God on the pages of Scripture. And then we have the living Word of God in Christ himself to us, speaking the words of God. And so we have before us a message that we are to hear. And it's not just going to help us in reducing conflict. Listen, it means and, and, and hangs upon the very salvation of our souls. That we hear the word. You see, uh, hearing the word of God is of singular, critical, and uh, singular importance to us today. And the reason is so important for our spiritual vitality is, is Jesus tells us in Matthew 4, 4, listen, man doesn't live by bread alone. He lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So more than anything, we need to hear his word. And so, as we gather here, we're to consider carefully what's heard so that we, we would uh, uh, not only miss the, not miss the message of Christ, but not live under condemnation thereby. A as a byword to that, your expectation of me is that every week I come prepared. I have to spend several hours in preparation for what's going to be said, and I'm a, a fallible servant in that way, but, but, but I am to come prepared. Well, understand that what this passage is saying is that there's an expectation on every one of us. You're supposed to hear. You see, if you're too tired, then you can't hear. That's going to make a demand on what you did the night prior. If you're too flustered with activities about what's going to go on later today, you know what that means? It means you're not going to hear. And it means also that you're accountable for it. Because what Jesus said is, Consider carefully what is heard. So it's not just my job to prepare. It's your job to prepare. To hear. To hear God's word for us to do so together so we wouldn't risk in a flippant manner of coming under his condemnation. So in writing his gospel, John has determined that he wants to declare the message of Christ. This, in fact, is what he says is his thesis statement. John 20, 30, and 31, he, he says, I've written these things to you that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and through believing you'd have life in his name. The reason he's given us words is so that we would consider Christ. So we would look to him and understand, believing on him, who he is. And so what John has done in the first half of his gospel is he has carefully explained and described the words and the works of Jesus. These have come in miracles. These have come in his teaching. This has come in his confrontation with his opposition in his teaching to his disciples in so many different accounts and ways and now in john chapter 12 it's a an interlude if you would in the story 
John pauses in chapter 12, and he's, he's just kind of reframing again the purpose for his writing. And from John chapter 13 to the end of the chapter, really, John's going to focus on the most important work of Jesus, his death on the cross, his sacrificial atonement for sinners. And, and he's going to focus on his death on the cross, his resurrection, and his appearances to his disciples following that. So before he moves to that most important theme, he pauses to get us ready. Okay? It's almost like he's saying, be careful what you hear. Consider very carefully the word of God to you. And here, he, he calls us again to consider carefully Christ and his claims. So, he's just going to uh, really give a, a summation again of those claims. And we see it in three specific ways that is spiritually incumbent upon us for us to consider very carefully. So, let me just show you these as we walk through them together and we read scripture together. And we look in John chapter 12 exactly how it is laid before us. Here's the first thing to consider. As you have your notes in front of you, I hope you'll use those to help you to consider carefully. Here's the first thing. I want you to take note of the glory of Christ. John says, consider carefully the glory of Christ. Let me show you uh, John chapter 12, starting in verse 37. Here's what John writes of Jesus. He says, Though he had done so many signs before them, signs, there are the word, uh, that's the word John would use to miracles. They're pointing to God, to Christ. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. John here is pointing out the glory of Christ. In fact, that's exactly what he refers to Isaiah having seen, doesn't it? He says he saw the glory of Christ. So he's talking about Christ's glory here. It's a re real key to understanding what has become I think for most of us, a very difficult passage to wrap our minds around. What do these words of John, these words which Jesus would quote, these words that originally centered in Isaiah's message, what exactly do they mean? You see, I think these are some of the most difficult in all of Scripture, in the Gospels themselves, for us to understand. But it's not because there's a scarcity of its teaching. Did you know this very passage, which is, now, quoted by John, spoken by Jesus, originally said by Isaiah. It is quoted very often throughout the Bible, in fact, quite often throughout the New Testament itself. Now, I want to just try to frame it again for you where we're at. Jesus, now, for several months, has been ministering uh, in a public way. He's been performing miracles publicly. He's been calling people to come to him, to believe on him publicly. The opposition has become great in that way. But you would assume that if Jesus Christ, who is the very glory of the Father, is in the flesh among us, people would be drawn to that. People would be flogging to come, wouldn't they? Why, there's never been a better preacher. There's never been a better, a better spiritual leader than Jesus Christ. Surely, he would draw a huge following of people. The anointing of God himself is upon him. But John says... Let me correct you in your thinking. That's not at all what was happening. Many people did not believe. Most people did not believe. The more he preached, the more clear it became who he was, the more it seemed that he would be rejected. And that's exactly what's happening. John's already made reference to this in his first chapter. We, we, we studied this uh, about a year ago. That he, he makes this statement that Jesus came to his own, but his own didn't receive him. Listen, the very people, the Jewish people, who had all the promises and the, the prophets and, and the law of God, they should have been ready for Jesus to come, and they weren't ready. When he came, they didn't accept him. They rejected him. Not just them, but so many that Jesus would speak to. And so we see that this is happening. And so John gives a disclaimer. This is what he does. He wants to explain why people are not following Christ. It's not because he is less than the glory of God himself. It's not because he speaks anything but the absolute truth of God. It's not because we're sinners desperately in need of such 
a mercy in that message. But what he explains is something, in fact, uh, very, very different than that. You see, the passage which John quotes come from Isaiah chapter 10, verse 1, and then again, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10. But these are far from the only places where we read such a doctrine. In fact, these very same words are shared by Jesus when he quotes them in the book of Matthew, chapter 10. And then Mark mentions the same in his gospel in Mark chapter 4. And then likewise, Luke in Luke chapter 8 also mentions these same words of Jesus. Paul, when he's preaching in Rome in the last chapter of the book of Acts, quotes these very words that are quoted here by Christ. Paul would also write in his letter to the Romans of the gospel. And with that gospel, he would give this caveat. He would explain that many would turn away from Christ, that many would not see him, that many would not believe on him, because they would not believe and they could not believe. God had blinded their eyes. He had stopped up their ears. And so the question for us is, is exactly what does this mean? See, theologians have a term for this, which is a biblical term. It's called the doctrine of election. It means that, that God uh, chooses, because that's exactly what the passage is. Let me just explain to you exactly what it says here, doctrine of election. Just to give you a theological definition. It's an act of God before creation in which he chooses all those who come to faith in Christ, not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign good pleasure. Now, let me, just, let me just speak to this. Because the fact is, most of us at the initial hearing find such a teaching reprehensible. Because here's what it sounds like. It sounds like God has arbitrarily chosen whom he loves and whom he hates. It seems like God has arbitrarily, without any a forethought, chosen who is saved and who is damned. But there could not be further from the truth. Because there's, there's nothing arbitrary about what it is that God is doing. So what does it mean? And the question for us is, as we stand here and we hear God's word, and, and John is preaching of people to look to Christ, why would he declare, I mean, if he, if he wants to draw a, a following, why would he... He say, some of you are never going to hear. Some of you are never going to believe. Because God stopped your ears. He, he closed up your eyes so that you can't see. Why would he give us this? Well, it's important for us to know why. What does this teaching mean? Let me give you at least two things that we know from the Scriptures. You'll see them behind me. The first is this. What this doctrine teaches is the depths of sin toward condemnation. You see, what you and I are blinded to most is just how awful is our sin. It condemns us before a God who is deserving of our obedience, our love, and our full surrender. You see, every person, every person, regardless of age or culture or standing or level of education or experiences in life, every single one of us is born into our sin and rebellion against God. Listen. We choose to sin, we want to sin, we don't want to obey or follow God. Our early ancestors, Adam and Eve, set the course for this, but the fact is we've all chosen the same again and again and again. We are, in every term, born sinners. The Bible calls this depravity, depraved, meaning, meaning listen, you don't have the power to obey God, and let's just be real honest, you don't even have the desire to. And if you say you do, it's really because of some proud, selfish motive within. Listen, we are evil to the core in this way. Every person is condemned to sin apart from Christ. Listen, here's the fact. If we were to be condemned eternally, you're getting exactly what you deserve. And the fact is, you're getting what you want. You're getting what you want. You see, that's what the condemnation of our sin means. We make little of sin, but what John is explaining again is, is there's nothing little about sin. Sin separates us from God. Sin, con sin condemns us forever, and we are full-on participants in it. And we cannot overcome it. It overcomes us every time. You see, when a sinner is condemned, God is glorified. Why? Because he's just. 
Because he stops up every mouth, as Romans 3 says, and proves that what he says is right. You see, that's what it means that the depths of our sin toward condemnation bring God glory. But here's the second thing about this doctrine. What it does is it exposes the sovereignty of God toward salvation. You see, there's a sovereignty of God in salvation. What do I mean by that? It means this, that the only means by which a sinner can be saved is God. That he, being rich in mercy, would look down upon a sinner and make a way for salvation through his only son. You see, it means that the work of salvation is the work of God alone. It's not because you, you, you were good enough to make the right choice. It's not because there's some righteousness inside of you that merited it. It's not because you were brought up in a good upbringing. It's not because of, of something that you can accrue to your account. It's only because God, in the richness of his mercy, before the very foundation of the world, not arbitrarily, but for the glory of his praise, would choose you to come to Christ. It's the only way we can be saved. If God steps in, and in fact what we're reading here is that the rejection of Christ is actually a fulfillment of prophecy. Isn't that, what, isn't that what he says? The reason they would not believe is because Isaiah, Isaiah quoted this. God is, is fulfilling the purposes which he designed in the very act of their rejection. You see, what this means is, is that when a sinner is saved, when a sinner is saved, God is glorified. Because only God could do that. Only God could do this, rich in his mercy toward us. Now, here's the real beef. Many will wonder just how. How does the doctrine of God's election coincide with the mandate for evangelism? I mean, if God foreordained, why do I need to tell anybody about Jesus? Listen, we could not be further off the mark in asking that question. We could not be further from it. Here's why. You see, the Word of God answers this in this way. Let me give you just a couple ways. First of all, we find in Isaiah, okay, where we, where we first get this doctrine at least explained. It's not the first time it's mentioned in Scripture, but, but it's explained by Isaiah in a greater way. This doctrine of God's electing. Listen, you know what the context of it is? Isaiah chapter 6. Here's the context. God says, who will go for me? And Isaiah stands up and says, here I am, send me. I'll take the gospel to the nations, right? So, so this, this doctrine doesn't in any way erase the mandate to go. In fact, it demands that we go. Jesus taught this in every single one of the Gospels. From his own lips would come this teaching. And yet, Jesus came as the Son of God to save the world. And what did he say? He stood before the crowd and said, Whoever will, come. Come to me. Come to me and put your faith in me and be saved. It doesn't erase the mandate. Paul probably no greater teacher than God's election than Paul. He writes of it extensively in Ephesians and then of course again in Romans we mentioned a moment ago and it's very difficult to understand but you know what it didn't pause Paul from taking the gospel around the world. He was persecuted he was given over in every way to the most awful thing so that he could proclaim the message of Christ to all nations so that people would come to Christ the great missionary of the church. Listen this doctrine's teaching in no way erases our call to go. In fact, it, it promotes our call to go. God sends us because in this he is glorified. You see, we get confused, but Scripture is not confused on this matter. I love the way Charles Spurgeon writes about this. You'll see behind me his words. He says, Beloved, do your master's work, win souls, preach Christ, expound your Bibles, pray men to be reconciled to God. Plead with men to come to Christ. This kind of work will stand the fire. And when the last great day shall dawn, this will remain to glory and honor. Beloved, cling to the great truth of electing love and divine sovereignty. But let not these bind you in fetters when in the power of the Holy Ghost you become fishers of men. We stand on the promises of God, but we go forth with the gospel. And see, it's in these very matters that Isaiah, we're told he saw the glory of Christ. He saw this. He saw God's sovereignty. He saw the condemnation of sin. He saw that, that, that God would send salvation. And so he saw Christ's glory. So, if you've not come to Christ, bid his call to come today. For he's chosen. And if you have come to Christ, do not 
so quickly set aside the great glory and grace by which he chose you to follow him, to save you for his glory. Don't make light of such a glory. Charles Spurgeon writes again on this. He says, you'll see behind me, whatever may be said about the doctrine of election, it is written in the word of God as with an iron pen, and there's no getting rid of it. To me, it's one of the sweetest and most blessed truths in the whole of Revelation. And those who are afraid of it are so because they don't understand it. If they could but know that the Lord had chosen them, it would make their hearts dance for joy. Listen, if you are in Christ, you are chosen. It wasn't arbitrary. It wasn't a mistake. It didn't just get passed on down to you by some family heirloom. Listen, it's because God chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now go forth in his glory glory of Christ, John says, I want you to see it. Now, here's the second thing. He says, consider carefully the mercy of Christ. We took a look at the glory of Christ. Now let's look at the mercy of Christ. Look with me at verses 42 through 43. John goes on to write. He says, nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Now, what John reminds us is he's, he's already spent a moment telling us that many people rejected Christ, but he doesn't want us to be oblivious to the fact that many people follow Christ. The message was effective. He says many were, in fact, believing. Jesus experienced immense opposition. But even among many of his own rejecting him, there were others who were leaving behind everything to follow Christ. And among this number, he states, were even some in the religious establishment. Listen, Jesus had no greater opposition than the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the chief priests. These are the guys that oftentimes are mentioned. John often just calls them with a capital J, the Jews. Right? He's talking about the opposition to Jesus. But they're the religious establishment. They are, at least in that culture, some of them the wealthiest, but, but most important, they had the, the greatest social standing in the community. They were considered righteous by their outward acts, and yet oftentimes they were the greatest opposition to Christ. In fact, when Jesus will die on the cross, we'll find when he's put on trial, it's by them primarily that have put forth a plan that this would happen. But what's amazing is, is that we're reminded that by the Father's choosing, don't forget that, he, he tells us that in John 6, 37, no one comes to Christ unless the Father chose them. By the Father's choosing, some of these, even of these, come to faith in Christ. It's amazing that we see this. They come to believe on him. But this faith, this description of it John gives us, is not without a caveat. Here it is. He says they would not publicly profess Christ Here's why. Because they were fearful. They were afraid of what would happen to their social standing. You see, he's really talking here about these religious leaders. And they were afraid that they were going to lose reputation and status among others. You see, if they followed Christ publicly, they're going to, their situation and their standing in life is going to change. Specifically, what John says is they were fearful of being kicked out of the synagogue. Now, let me give you a picture of what the synagogue is. The synagogue, for all practical purposes and our understanding, is the local church. It was the local gathering of those who believed in Yahweh. It's the, the Old Testament version, you could say, of that. And it was the place of, of standing and, and, and the place of social uprightness in the community. Listen, oftentimes your, your economic standing was in conjunction with your standing in the synagogue because it was a religious culture. And so if uh, you were considered in good standing in the synagogue, then it would affect you economically. It would affect your relationships, your family. If you didn't have a good standing in the synagogue, why, you, you're probably not going to get invited over for Thanksgiving and Christmas meals. You see, it had everything to do with who you were in the community. And so if these men were to follow Christ, family relations would be strained, financial prospects would be affected, One's entire social sphere would be upended. And so to despair such distress, they kept quiet about the matter. Secretly, on the inside, they believed to some degree. 
Jesus' teaching was making sense to them. They, they believed what he was saying about himself, but they kept it back. Quite simply, John tells us that they cared more about the glory of man than they did the glory of God. They cared more about what people thought than what God thought. And so it explained the matter. Here's the question that begs our asking, though. If these were not publicly confessing Christ, how did John know that they were believers? I mean, if you don't publicly profess him, how do you know? You see, that is the question. And, and what helps us to understand is, is knowing that it's very important for us to publicly confess Christ. In fact, Jesus would speak to this. Look behind me. You'll see on the screen this important teaching from Jesus, Matthew chapter 10. Jesus states, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. You see, the Word of God makes very plain. One must follow Christ personally, but one cannot follow Christ privately. It must be public, or else no one knows you're not really a follower of Christ if it's not a public following and such. So what is John writing about here? Does John have some secret knowledge of which we don't? It helps us understand when and where John is writing. Remember, John is writing his gospel toward the end of the first century. It's been 30, 40, 50 years since these events have occurred. And so now John is reflecting back on what has happened. And since the time of Christ, since his death, his resurrection, his appearing, since the coming of the Holy Spirit and the beginnings of the church, now some of these who rejected Christ formally have come to faith in Christ. See, they were rejecting him then. But now they've come to Christ in faith. There's at least a, a couple of examples we can find in Scripture. We're going to read of them again when we come to the end of John's Gospel. Two very prominent. One is a guy by the name of Nicodemus. Remember? Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. He was fearful uh, of being caught with Jesus out in broad daylight. But there seems to be within him stirring a faith. Not made public yet. And there's another one, a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. We know less about him. Only this, that he was so wealthy that he had a place where he could have a, a, an unborrowed, an unused tomb that Jesus would use where he would be buried. You see, he too was a secret disciple while Jesus was alive. But upon Jesus' death, both of these men came forward and said, we're followers of Christ too. Publicly, we follow Christ. You see, what does this show us? And we see it also in the book of Acts. You can read, if you read on in Acts, that, that many who had rejected Christ at the time of his life, his death, that they would come to a place of faith in him. What does this tell us? This is how great the mercy of Christ is. That he'll take a sinner who has rejected him blatantly, who stood by while he was nailed to the cross silently, and he'll draw them to himself, and he'll forgive them. That's the mercy of that's the mercy of Christ that we see on display here. Uh, see, see being displayed here. That that it's so astounding, and even men who stood by while Jesus was maligned, speaking not a word, could still be forgiven. Listen, they're not the only ones, are they? We read in the gospel accounts that Peter, that bold disciple of Jesus, the leader of the group, self-proclaimed, and even by Jesus attested that. Because he cared more about what a servant girl thought of him than Jesus, he denied that he ever knew Christ. Three different occasions. Listen, even God, even Peter, could be forgiven by God. God will forgive even someone like that. And look, look, if we're going to be honest, I mean, let's just put it all on the table. Every one of us has denied Christ in some setting, some way. Perhaps even now, you're still under that sphere. The reality is, that God's mercy in Christ is so great that he'll take a sinner who's denied him again and again and rejected him again and again publicly and privately, and he'll take him and he'll forgive him and he'll save him. What does this mean? It means this, at the very least. There's not a single thing you've ever done, said, or thought that can't be forgiven by Christ. Not a single thing. He came to save us all, and his mercy is great. And if you come to faith in him, he will forgive you. He will. He'll forgive us of anything. That's exactly what it means. How great is his mercy? Why should we consider it? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 2.4, you'll see behind me, 
he writes this, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? How does God draw you? By his kindness. By his kindness. He says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come to me, all who would, and I'll forgive. Come to me and find the richness of my grace. The author of the hymn, Amazing Grace, that we all know and cherish very much is John Newton. You probably know that. He wrote that hymn out of his own experience. It wasn't just in the halls of, uh, of a seminary that he came up with those great words. It was out of his own experience. He experienced God's grace in his own life personally as every sinner does. His mercy poured upon him. And so this would be his epitaph what was written by his own hand on his tombstone. Note what he writes. You see behind me. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. And throughout the ages of humanity, at least his life is a testimony to the extent of God's grace. But his is not the only one. It's all of us. If you would come to faith in Christ, being forgiven by him, being redeemed by him, then you are a testimony that God can forgive the worst of sinners. And he is that kind of God. It's the mercy of Christ. That said, do not presume upon his mercy by withholding your faith today by withholding your profession. You see, some might say, well, well, look at all these guys. They were followers of Jesus, just not ever publicly. Listen, if they never came public, they were never followers of Christ. And so, don't presume on his mercy. You may say, well, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm just a secret believer. There is no such thing. And here's what Paul writes about that. Right after he speaks of God's kindness leading us to repentance, he says this in Romans 2, 5. You'll see it. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. You come to Christ today, or else it may be too late. You've stored up God's wrath for yourself. Here's the third thing that John wants us to say. Consider carefully to Christ. We've looked at his glory. We've looked at his mercy. Now he speaks of his truth. And this is where we see the, uh, at least the, the, the longest section before us. I'll read it to you. You follow along with me. The truth of Christ, starting in John 12, verse 44, says this. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say, what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. This is the truth of Christ John wants us to consider. And John's recording of these words really seem to be a summation, a restatement, if you would, of what Jesus has already said. Remember, that's what John chapter 12 is. It's, uh, it's an interlude between what Jesus has already done and, and his greatest work on the cross. And so he wants to just give us a reminder again of, of many of the things Christ has said. And, and listen, John doesn't write this because he's, he's searching for new material. That's not the problem. Uh, he says there was so much that Jesus said and did that every book in the world couldn't be used to fill it up. No, he doesn't need new material, but he's using a, a thing that um, is often used, uh, a, a literary tool, if you would, that's often used in the Scriptures. He's going to repeat the matter again, in case you didn't hear the first time. Uh, for those of you who are parents and grandparents, you know that you might have to repeat yourself a couple of times on some matters. Listen, that's an important thing, and every one of the gospel writers, every one of the New Testament writers speaks to this. I'm going to say it again. Let me say this again. Let me repeat myself again in case you didn't hear. So John is doing the same, and he challenges us. 
take a close look at Jesus, consider carefully his words and his works. And so there's two things of note that we can look to here. John 12, 48, we read it a moment ago, but I want to point out to you just three things here that are important for us to consider of his words. First of all, this is what he says, we are accountable to a judge. Regardless of our response to the judge, we will give an accounting of him with our lives. You, you, you may or may not consider the words of Christ important. It matters not. You have a judge, and you will stand before him. You will give an accounting of your life to him. And Jesus wants to make this very clear as we consider his words. Now, the second thing is this. He tells us this, that there is a standard by which he judges the standard is, are the words of Christ. And when I say the words of Christ, I'm speaking to all of the Scriptures because all of the Scripture, the 66 books which comprise our Old and New Testament, they are the words of Christ, commissioned by Him, given by Him. And this is our judge. You see, the Scriptures are not just one opinion among many opinions. They're not suggestions for good living. To obey the Bible is life. To disobey the Bible is condemnation. And so our judgment, when we stand before Christ, will be his very words. Now here's the last thing. We understand this from what he says. There's a day set for judgment. There's a day that's already been set. You and I don't know the day. He knows the day full well. But you can know this, that the day is coming. And so we're to spend our time being ready and prepared. And listen, most people don't recognize or acknowledge that that day exists. They'd rather consider it as some some religious handiwork, something that really doesn't matter. But the fact is, there is a day that has been set. Every man's been appointed once to die, and after that, the judgment. And so because this is true, Jesus makes it clear in the statement that we need to consider it care carefully. Now, in, in verse 49, the next verse, there's something else to consider here. There's a unique word that Jesus uses. It's unique, not because it's unique in all of Scripture. In fact, if you're familiar with the Bible at all, it's a pretty common word, but it's unique to John. He doesn't use it as much. It's the word commandment. It's not used very often by John in his, in his gospel. He uses it more in his epistles. Commandment. It's, it's not unfamiliar to us. We have some type of understanding. The Greek word actually means prescription. That's what it means. Something that is prescribed written down and to be followed exactly. We have an understanding of this. You see, the Father has prescribed to the Son exactly what to say. And the Son prescribes to us exactly what we need to hear. And so it's a prescription that's to be followed exactly. And it's not a point that we need to dismiss because everything in our world, in our flesh, and from our enemy, Satan, opposes this idea of what God has prescribed. Let me give you some examples. From our culture, we are told that we need to be tolerant people. Tolerance, in fact, is the great mantra of our day, if you would. It's that great character that sets a good person from a bad person apart. And you see, this is what the word tolerance actually means and what it, in fact, used to mean. It means that People can have opposing ideas. One is right, one is wrong, but we can respect a person because they're created in the image of God. I don't respect their idea, but I respect the person. I, I, can, I can love the person and still disagree with their idea. But here's what tolerance now means in our culture. It means this, that you must celebrate anything anybody believes. And if you don't celebrate it, then you're a hate monger. You can't disagree with anybody anymore. That makes you an intolerant person. And for fear of that, listen, we don't stand up for the truth, do we? We don't say what's right. We don't say what's hard because it seems unloving. When God's word clearly speaks against a lifestyle or a behavior or a choice, we stand up and we say, no, that's wrong. And, and if that's what you call intolerant, then so be it. That is a way that our culture fights against the prescription of God. Here's how the flesh fights against it. We're tempted to choose those things which are most comfortable and pleasing to our fleshly desires. Listen, the fact is, it's a lot easier to go with the flow. 
It's a lot easier to not stick out. It's a lot easier to just to do what's most comfortable to me, to try to just keep everybody happy and things going forth as they are and not stand up and say, no, that's wrong. We can't think that way. We can't live that way. We can't do that. That displeases God. And so our flesh fights against it. And the truth doesn't gratify the desires of the flesh. Finally, this prescription of God is fought against from our enemy, Satan. Because we are tempted by him, as he always has tempted the people of God, to question the reliability of God's word. So in other words, well, you know, that used to be true. Fifty years ago, that was true. But in you know, times have changed. You ever hear this? Times have changed. Listen, truth doesn't change. God's word is God's word. What he says about the culture, what he says about men and women, what he says about every institution he's placed under heaven, listen, it's still as true today as it's ever been true, and so we stand on it. Principles of truth are not malleable. They don't change with the times, regardless of how much the enemy would tempt us. You see, most of us are really familiar with the immovability and the reliability of a prescription. Those old pharmacists, they can be pretty pretty staunch in their directions, can't they? Take one of these four times a day. Not two, three times a day. Not one every other week. Because you see, if you don't take it the way you're supposed to, either it has no effect on your body toward health, or it has just the opposite. And that pill that's meant to save will kill very quickly. You see, that's what we understand as a prescription. That's what God has given. A commandment, a prescription. You do what the Word says. And if you do not, it's to your own eternal peril. See, truth, ultimately, Jesus states here, is not an idea an opinion, a cultural phenomenon, or a suggestion. Truth is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the truth. And so because it is so, to ignore him is eternally to our own peril. No matter is eternally more important than this. You need to consider very carefully today who Christ is. You need to consider the glory of Christ, the mercy of Christ, and the truth of Christ. There's much more to consider. But before us today, we have God's word in just this. Listen, if his claims are true, then there is nothing that compares to what you and I have heard today. There's nothing else that compares to his truth. Everything in our lives must center upon this. Everything in our lives must be surrendered to this regardless. Everything must fall under his purposes. See, what we find here in this passage today before us is just this, that God is calling us to himself in his truth. And so just as he calls us to himself in his truth, in this passage, what we find and declare, find declared here today is just this, that we can only come to Christ, not on our own doing, but only through the gospel What do the scriptures tell us about this? Well, the gospel, I want to make very plain to you again. Uh, For those of you who have already trusted Christ, let it be an encouragement that he's chosen you in him. For those of you who hadn't, he's calling you today to come. Here's what he says. We learn this of the gospel, that first, there is bad news to understand. The bad news is this. You and I are sinners. We are cut off from God. We are set apart from him in eternity. We're under his wrath. This is bad news right now. But the The news gets worse. The worst news is there's nothing you can do about it. You can't save yourself. You're not righteous, nor can you be good enough to appear before God on your own. You'll only be rejected. That's what leads us to the good news. The good news is is that God did send his son, Jesus. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose again from the dead, and through him, we could have eternal life. He wants to forgive us. He calls us, bids us to come, even now. This is good news. But here's the best news. That even today, if you would turn from your sin and turn to faith in Christ, then you could have eternal life. You could be forgiven. There's not a single thing you've done that Christ can't forgive you. That means that he's calling you today if you hear his voice pleading through his word. 
as you feel the sting of his conviction, you come and you follow him. Listen, if you've already followed Christ, then you give praise to God that before the creation of the world, he would choose you in his great mercy for his glory, which means now that you go forth in that glory and you live forth a life of repentance and faith to the glory of God, proving what he's done in your life. For those of you who have yet to come, Jesus says today, come. Any who would come, today you can by his mercy and his grace. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of response, and I want to give you the opportunity to do so. And I'm going to pray for you right now, and as I pray, let's just consider carefully what Christ has said. Consider how he would call us to believe. Let's pray together this morning. God, I thank you so much, Lord, for your mercy just in this. God, that you would give your word to us, not because we're a people willing to hear it, Lord. Most of us are just fine to go on about our merry way without ever hearing your truth, but God, you would give it to us because it is your design and for your glory. God, that you would bring us to a place where we can consider carefully again what we hear when we come now. And as we come before you in your word today, Having heard what we have, Lord, now help us to act upon it in faith. God, thank you that in Christ we're chosen before the creation of the world. And for those of us who've come to faith in you, thank you, God, for saving us now. Lord, now let us go forth and live for your glory, God, proclaiming this gospel, telling all who would come. Let us live out our faith to the glory of God, showing forth the fruit of repentance. Oh, God, do this through your mercy in us. How we need you today. Lord, I pray for those who have never come to faith in you, Christ, many still reject you. And yet as you call them, O oh Lord, that even today they would come to faith in you. They would call upon your name. They would turn from sin and turn to faith in Christ and in so doing find your great mercy. O oh God, may you be glorified in doing such today for only you can. And Lord, even now in this time of response as we pray, as we consider carefully, oh God, will you be glorified in this moment that we would follow you for nothing compares. We ask it in Jesus' name.